Hello, everyone. Welcome to Full Spectrum Survival. Today, we have an interview with City Prepping. City Prepping has over 57,000 subscribers on YouTube, where he works to help everyday people learn the basics of survival in preparation for a time of crisis. So, CP, how are you today? I'm doing pretty well. How are you? I'm doing real good. Thanks for thanks for asking and thanks for coming on. Can I ask you first, why did you start the channel? You know, I started the channel really, uh, a lot of it came out of living in Southern California and looking at the situation around me where we live in um, an environment that's, you know, overdue for an earthquake and so many other factors. And uh, I just realized, hey, I need to get things in order for both me and my family if there were an event that were to happen, uh, whether it be an earthquake or any other type of event. And uh, having a background in Boy Scouts and living out in the outdoors a lot growing up, I think the two kind of came together. And, you know, uh, well, I'm not, I don't consider myself any kind of a bushcraft survivalist. I do consider myself, you know, someone that loves learning about survivalism. And it really was a genesis of what got me kind of on the path to actually produce videos for YouTube. And I didn't really find a lot in this particular area where, or, you know, for urban environments. And I decided, hey, you know, uh, let me start a channel that really kind of focuses on helping the general population that, that you know, for the most part lives in large cities. That's great. Yeah. And, you, and you've done some NGL work too, right? In, in Afghanistan and Mexico. Yeah. Yeah. In college back in 96, I used to do a lot of work down in Mexico. Uh, my first trip down to Mexico, we were helping in a community, ended up losing my appendix down there. We're too far south of the border to get back in time. Wow. Uh, so that was, a, <laughs> that, was a, that was an interesting experience. And then in 2003, uh, there was an opportunity to go in with a group of physicians in Kabul uh, you know, post uh, Taliban, the collapse, the city kind yeah. of stabilized. And so went in and I, you know, while I'm not a physician, I did help teach English and help uh, in the medical clinic that we had there at Kabul University. Well, well, thanks for, you know, just from everyone, thanks for doing that because work, working with an NGO and actually getting your feet on the ground in areas that really needed is a, it's an opportunity for, for you as a person, but what a great experience to be able to see the culture and see really the need for preparedness back here on North American soil. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, being in those environments, it gives you obviously number one appreciation for what we have, but secondly, it it, uh, it it shows you, hey, if things were to go really bad, what does it look like? And while I would by no means wish this upon our country, you know, after having seen what I did, it taught me that, hey, if things were to go south, if we did go into a, a collapse or whatever things would look like, at least I've got that experience that it can never be taken away from me. I know what it's like to live in those environments, and that That's to me right. is, you know, very important. Yeah, absolutely. Now you have had some extremely viral videos. Uh, what do you feel is the most helpful video that you've produced for the community so far? Yeah, well, um, have, you know, it's funny how they work out with videos. The ones that you're like, well, I'll just kind of produce it and not think much of it. Those end up blowing up. And, you know, the ones that you really put, you know, so much time and, you know, research and they kind of do okay. And um, <laughs> I, you know, it, it just, you never know how it's going to work out. But I think for me, you know, number one, I, I look at when I come to prepping, I try to break things down in a very basic way that hopefully people can understand like, hey, how do I, how can I approach this in bite-sized chunks? Um, I did one on the six mutable laws of prepping, and I think that's a good starter video for someone that's getting into prepping that really doesn't even know like, hey, where do I start? Because when you get into prepping, there can be so many things that can be overwhelming, like, oh, I got to do all these things or buy all this stuff. And I thought that was a good solid video to kind of give some foundations. Uh, for me, living in Southern California, water is a big issue. I did do a video, you know, explaining long-term water storage. And to me, that right. was a very important video. And I, you know, have to spend a lot of time and energy making sure my water preps are up to date. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, water is such an important part of life. And with your background in microbiology, you, of course, know the the speed at which a a human can be, you know, succumb to waterborne disease. Yeah, absolutely. I did a video on uh, how to, you know, how to purify water. And again, not a viral video, but for me, I learned a lot in doing that video. Uh, you know, one of the things, again, having a microbiology background, if you've been, you know, ever seen after a major event hits an area, what do you always see on the news? You know, there's always different uh, diseases that spread through the communi uh, community quickly That's within, right. you know, 48, uh, 72 hours. It happens quickly. And just having that ability to, you know, being able to have obviously, number one, a, uh, a good clean source of water, and then two, being able to purify it uh, should it go bad. I learned a lot about that during the process and I, you know, I just can't stress that enough. I, I think people assume they're going to go out, you know, and go get water from a stream. And I, I used to mountain climb a lot and, uh, back in, I forget exactly when around 91, 92, I contracted Giardia one time I was up uh, climbing a mountain in Colorado and Giardia has about a two week incubation, uh, incubation period. And yeah, when that hit, um, it laid me out. I mean, I, I couldn't do anything. And, yeah, um, and, and, you know, people don't understand that waterborne disease kills more people around the world yeah. than all of the wars and all of the pestilence combined. 
Absolutely. And uh, for me, you know, again, being in a, in a desert area here in Southern California, semi, semi arid area, it's uh, having good, you know, uh, source of water is it's just life and death here. Huge. Yeah. Well, uh, okay. So I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. Your main focus with your channel, of course, is surviving in an urban environment. And you produce very high quality videos on this subject. Can you tell me how you're planning to survive in an urban environment and what you could give to the community just to get them started? Because no matter what, you know, even if even if someone lives lives in a very rural area, they, uh, disaster might strike a wildfire, a tornado, an earthquake, even just a natural disaster could strike while they're in town. So what kind of considerations do they need to have for that urban survival? Yeah. So when I started the channel, again, I, I sat down and started doing the numbers and I realized, you know, that a good chunk of the United States population, um, as I might have mentioned a second ago, I believe in excess of 80 percent of the population lives in some type of an urban suburban environment. And, you know, to just tell people, hey, if things go bad, just go to the country or, you know, go go outside. I mean, that's not just going to be that's not a realistic uh, suggestion because, I mean, right. how many people are going to just be able to pick out, pick their whole family and go somewhere if things happen? I mean, where are they going to go? What resources are they going to have? So. I thought it was really important to say, hey, you know, in my own life to say, if something were to happen, how am I going to build a shelter in place? How am I going to be able to survive? How am I, how am I going to be able to work with my neighbors uh, to connect with them and try to help teach them? And so one of the things I begin to do is get to know my neighbors. And I talk about this in my videos. Uh, it's sometimes in the prepping community, we can be really to ourselves. We don't want to tell anybody. And almost to the point, you know, where a lot of the comments I get on some of my videos, uh, you know, it almost sounds like people are a bit reclusive. And so I think it's going to be critical for people to get to know and work with others. And again, that doesn't mean you have to go around and tell everybody, hey, I'm a prepper, you know, because obviously that has a lot of implications. But to begin to help educate your neighbors, that, you know what, for example, where I live, we live in a very earthquake prone area. Uh, right. It wouldn't be a bad idea to store up on water, uh, store up on food, have a basic plan in place. And so I begin to try to help, you know, neighbors understand these principles without trying to push it. And, uh, and I've also really begin to work with networking with other preppers in my area. Uh, through different meetup groups, uh, neighbors in my neighborhood, uh, you know, that don't necessarily call themselves preppers, but for the most part, they are, I can tell. So I think it's just really important if, if you're going to live in an urban environment, you know, I think it's totally possible to survive after a major event. It's going to be difficult, but if you have things in place, you prepared, I think it's possible. Yeah. I, and there's, you know, there's so many things happening in the news cycle. There's the bird flu over in Asia. Uh, our recent, you know, Tyson chicken over in Tennessee just had their first case of the H7N9 variation of the avian influenza virus. So there's so many things going on, whether it's earthquakes, wildfires, uh, you know, biological threats, just these everyday things that are in the news cycle that you can bring up a line of discussion with someone and say, hey, you know, what do you think about this? And just, just let them talk, you know, be quiet and just let them talk and then start to see how uh, how open they are to the idea of self-reliance rather than just relying on the government to, uh, you know, come and save them in a disaster. Yeah, you know, I just did a video for the Canadian Prepper Channel, and I did a breakdown of Southern California from a prepping perspective. And it was a bit eye-opening, even when I did the video and began to research the material that how even uh, different leaders within the communities here are, you know, different leading scientists, uh, very respected individuals are beginning to warn the general population that, look, when this hits, and, you know, they keep telling us we're overdue, we're overdue, we're overdue. Uh, when things hit, um, you know, they're not going to be able to get in in time and take care of you. The reality right. is there's going to be bigger issues you're going to have to deal with. And, you know, someone may not come to you or, or even have the supplies you need within the first few weeks. And how many people even have, bare, you know, even a three-day supply, very few, less, let alone a two-week supply, which they're recommending we have. And that was, again, kind of a kick for, you know, kind of a kick in the pants for me to begin, you sure. know, to realize I've got to get serious about this because, um, if anything happens, I, you know, I, I don't want to watch my family, you know, uh, without water or food. I, I just can't imagine being in that scenario. And so I don't think it's a fear based issue. I think it's just common sense. It's it's like insurance. You know, you're kind of <laughs> just like, hey, we know this is coming. So why not prepare? Yeah, exactly. You're absolutely right. Um, what are your thoughts on a person's need to get out of the city if it if it goes that way, if they feel that they have to get out, if things are bad, maybe there's social unrest. Really, you know, there's a long line of possibilities. How quickly do you think they need to move before the rest of the people decide it's time to get into a rural environment? Yeah, that's something I've studied a lot uh, and looked at on different forums and talked to different preppers. Um, well, for me, where I live in Southern California, getting out is not an easy thing. I mean, we're we're kind of blocked into this area with very few exits, especially, again, if we have an earthquake. A lot of the major freeways go over the fall line. So right. reality is, unless, you know, you have, well, 
you know, I, I met with a gentleman yesterday who's a prepper. He's um, in his 60s, and he's been doing this most of his life. And very level-headed individual, great guy. And you know, he studies this nonstop, looking you know for different escape or different. I, I say escape routes, but you know, different back ways to get out of the area. You know, whether yeah. you know, on a dirt bike or hiking out. And so, I think to your question, you know, how important is it to get out? For me, in my area, in my different situations, there may not be a lot of warning. And so, having that thought out in advance is critical. My strategy at the moment is to bug, you know, stay in place. I would like to bug out, but again, if you know, if you do not have a location to go to, uh, you know, I think you're going to end up being a refugee. Now, there may be situations where you have no choice, you know, whether it be like a wildfire or something that forces you out. In that case, having the ability to have your gear in place, and that's something I'm working on over the next few months, is beginning to line up my gear so I can just grab it and go. You know, prioritize like, okay, I need to be able to grab X, Y, and Z in five minutes and be out the door if something comes. Yeah, uh, right. you know, again, wildfire or other scenarios that forces us out. Uh, civil unrest. I mean, that's that's becoming a, a bigger and bigger issue now. As you know, things are becoming so polarized in our nation on political issues, um, especially where I live by a big city, LA, San Diego's down the road. For the most part, they've been pretty calm, but there is you know potential for those to be you know uh, very volatile very quickly. And uh, so it's it's something I think about a lot. It's something that I'm working on, and I encourage people. You know, if you don't have at least the bare minimum, you know, the ability to bug out, grab gear, water, food, uh, you know, shelter, throw it in your car, take your family, and go. I think that's something that you need to put a high priority on. Uh, again, in an ideal situation, I can stay in place, you know, bug in place or, or, you know, stay in place, shelter in place sure. if something happens. But uh, obviously, we've got to have that plan B. Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, speaking of shelter in place, you did a video on raised bed gardening. Can you tell me sort of what you learned uh, in your research there and how important a raised bed garden is and whether a container gardening can really be done by anyone? Yeah, that's a great question. I, uh, when I go on different Prepper forums, one of the things I see a lot of times is, you know, people will talk about the seeds they have and, you know, having all these seeds and, you know, being ready. And, right. you know, I've never asked a lot of these people, but I, I assume a lot of these people probably have not ever gardened before. And prior to me starting this raised bed garden, I've never gardened in my life. I mean, I, I grew up in the country. We had a garden. My dad did that, but I never really dealt with it. I saw him do it. Um, and so, you know, I started uh, researching on YouTube and all the videos all pointed back to a book, uh, The Square Foot Gardening. I believe the gentleman's name is Mel. I forget his last name. Uh, but it's a book that sold millions. Again, yeah. I have no experience with gardening. Picked it up. It's very, very uh, well broken down. The guy's an engineer. He was not a gardener at all. He just looked at gardening from an engineer's perspective. And that's what uh, was, a, you know, initiated him starting that book. And so it, it just broke it down in a very simple way that, hey, you can set this up. Here's, you know, step by step. Here's how you make the soil. You know, you don't have to deal with you know, learning all the pH balance. You don't have to deal with weeds, et cetera, if you do the soil yourself. And he, he explains how to break it down. And so for me, I've, I've built one. Uh, I'm learning. I'm seeing it up, you know, already the uh, the different seeds that I, I planted, that things are already starting to grow. So that's been really exciting. And I'm just going to start working on adding more. But I encourage people, if they've never gardened, you know, it, it doesn't take much space. Uh, the, it's a four by four garden. Um, you know, hopefully if you even live in an apartment, you can, you know, find that if you have that on your balcony. Uh, but it's, it's very practical. And I think, you know, if you've never done gardening, that would be a great area to start with. Okay. Yeah. And what are your thoughts on, uh, even if someone doesn't feel they have that space, should they just start in a two liter bottle or, you know, a, a tub or anything just to start to learn the nuances of gardening? Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the things that, again, was kind of the, the reason I got into gardening, not necessarily to, you know, become, you know, to have this huge garden in my backyard. But beyond, the primary reason is because I just want to learn how to do this, uh, whether that be in a four by four or, you know, uh, you know, if I had more land to do it in that environment. But if I was restricted to, you know, a smaller environment like an apartment, 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 uh, even though he talks about that, you know, you kind of scale that four by four down. I mean, uh, it's not too hard. It's six inches deep, you know, and so even if you were to build a small container, you know, even if it's again, two liter, I mean, learn the premises, learn how to work with soil, learn how to, you know, deal with seeds and planting and timing and stuff like that. Um, I, I think everybody at some level should get involved with that, you know, to have some kind of a long-term viable solution to replenish their food. Yeah, right. That's a good point. Now you did a video on the six immutable survival laws and a lot of people probably, you know, I have a background in, in programming. I know you do. So mutable and immutable is a very common term for us. What can you explain to the average person if they don't know what that is and what those laws are? Yeah. So uh, basically the reason I did the video is again, I, when I, when I started really doing these videos, I, I, I look at things from a a lot of times I'll, I'll watch videos on YouTube and there's so much that's explained and it's kind of hard to put it all together uh, because you have to start watching a lot of different videos. And what I tried to do in this video is, is just say, hey, 
here are the six kind of you know bedrock foundational things you need to learn as a prepper at least start with and right. uh you know the basic things like obviously for me living out here in southern california number one is water uh then you know work on your food uh, you know, have some kind of finances in place, whether that's uh, for me, I, you know, I, I look at having cash for at least the first couple of weeks of things happen that, you know, our electrical grid goes down, uh, having medical in place, uh, having security in place. And uh, then the last one, I think on my list, number six was the ability to bug out if it came down to it. Yeah. And so I, I think those are six simple foundational principles within prepping. Um, I know a lot of times it can be easy for one to be elevated over the other. Uh, a lot of times, especially um, I know a lot of people go back and forth in the prepping community, especially like on firearms. And sometimes that can become a huge priority. Uh, I enjoy firearms. Uh, it's something I, you know, it's a hobby of mine. But I know at the end of the day, if something were to happen, um, you know, everybody's not going to go crazy and start rushing my house. I'm going to need to be able to, you know, feed my family, uh, have water. I need those basic things in place. And so hopefully, if you know, if you have the chance to watch the video, you can see that uh, a good even approach to all six of these principles, I think, will make, make you well-rounded. That's, that's good. Now you talked about mobility being the last thing on those immutable survival laws. And you also did another great video on an EDC or a daily carry bag. Can you tell me what your thoughts were and your considerations in building that carry bag and really what you learned while doing it or made changes to? Yeah. Yeah. The EDC bag, it was probably one of my first videos I did. And um, at the time, um, you know, I, I hadn't done a ton of research, but again, having a background of Boy Scouts, uh, the motto is be prepared. And right. a lot of times <laughs> the mindset is like, well, just, you know, almost over prepare for things, have all the gear you need. And yeah, so when I did the bag, you know, so when I did the bag and looking back, people were ripping me in the comments. They're like, what the heck is this? This thing's a, you know, full, <laughs> full blown bug out bag. And I was like, well, I think you're kind of right. You know, it, it is, it's a lot of gear. Um, and so I'm going to start scaling it down here pretty soon. I, you know, I, I work from home, so I'm not out a lot. But when I do, I always throw that in the back of my pickup bed or, you know, the back of my uh, backseat of my pickup. And uh, it has a lot of good foundational things that I need to, you know, or, or not found it, but, but different things I need in order, I think, to get home. It, it's almost kind of a, a get home bag in a, in a lot of ways. So it's something I'll probably work on scaling down. But there are some essential things that I think every prepper should have, you know, whether it's the ability to, you know, like a cigarette lighter, start a fire. Uh, you know, whether it be a compass. And I know a lot of people kind of rip me on putting a water filter in there, but where I live, again, water's so rare. If I can find it, I'm definitely going to want a way to, you know, be able to process it. Well, you know, a lot of the only people that'll rip you for that are people who haven't tried to carry a gallon of water for a couple of miles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's no fun. So I tried to just, again, put enough gear that it's, if, if um, we travel a lot to LA, uh, we have family out there and, you know, I get a little antsy when we go to LA because it's so much, you know, high density population. And again, yeah. um, if anything were to happen again, I'm not looking on my shoulder for something to happen, but I just want that ability, that peace of mind to know, do I have the essential items in place um, to take care of my family if, if anything happens? Yeah. Right. Well, speaking of that, you know, you say you're not looking over your shoulder for a disaster to strike, but you are aware of the fact that one could happen at any moment. And that's why it's a crisis. That's why it's a disaster, because you don't see it coming necessarily, but it just catches the majority of people off guard. What do you think our largest risk, at least in North America, is with our current geopolitical and environmental climate? Yeah, that's something I think about a lot. Um, again, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you've ever checked out the Urban Preppers channel, um, yeah. great channel. And I think what what did he say in an article that I read lately that, you know, if you are trying to prepare for the, uh, you know, zombie apocalypse, but you can't change your own tire on your car, then you kind of get back, you know, things backwards. And right. uh, I, I, I think for me, that's where, you know, again, I look at prepping as, as kind of steps, so to speak. You start with the basics and work up from there. It's like, OK, do I have the ability, you know, again, like he talks about, can I take care of the essential things and then move on to more of the advanced things? And I, I don't know how things are going to play out. I, I think uh, I think it was the uh, Canadian prepper that said on one of his videos, you know, we are in the age of consequences. And I think that's a good summary of kind of where things are as this nation. A lot of things are now catching up to us that have over the years have been kind of pushed back and things are now catching up and really um, in a way that's difficult to deal with. How things are going to shake down over the next several years, I'm not sure. Um, I again, I don't, I don't, I don't feel, you know, I feel a little uneasy at times. But I again, you know, prepping a lot of it is self reliance and teaching yourself how to take care of yourself, not looking for the government to take care of you. Right. Um, there's a great book I enjoy, Dave Ramsey, the, uh, his book on the financial peace, and that's his whole approach: is look, uh, you need to learn how to take care of yourself and be self reliant. And so, for me, I, I really don't know exactly what's going to come down the pipe, but I know at the end of the day. 
I live in Southern California. We have a lot of challenges that we're warned about. I'll start there and expand out. But at my end game at this time is to learn to be able, or to be able to get to a place of hopefully self sustainability for at least one year. Yeah, right. And that's a smart and good approach. You know, that's something obtainable, which yeah. is important. I think you have to make obtainable goals and then try to make, me, you know, meet those goals, whether it's creating a one year plan, uh, you know, creating a uh, plan to go completely off the grid, really, no matter what someone has in mind, make a goal and then do everything that you can to start work toward, you know, working towards it. Yeah, it, it's tough because again, you can get overwhelmed when you begin to start uh, with prepping because it seems like there's so many things that are going to get done. But I, I'm, I'm just looking at it as, again, as a marathon. It's not a sprint. You know, okay, how do I get this stage dealt with now? And, you know, I'm beginning to look at getting property to, you know, if I have to bug out to or even move to, to have larger property to, but again, that's that's something down the road. I, I don't think I'm going to get to it today, but I know right. I'm going to get things in place now and I'll, I'll work toward that. You know, and I think everyone goes through cycles in their own preparedness. And I know a big cycle of mine was I started out as the kitchen sink guy, like you said, you know, just put everything in the backpack. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you're you kind of rough through it while you're while you're uh, you know, going on hikes and everything, you deal with it. And then after months and months of this, or even over years, you look and say, okay, well, what can I change? You know, what can I do different? And so for me, I've went through a cycle where it started as the kitchen sink, just throw it all in there. Yeah. And then I have slowly narrowed, narrowed, narrowed down my pack and, and just my lifestyle to now more a primitive and uh, minimalistic lifestyle. So, you know, rather than having uh, six different cutting tools. I only have a couple, you know, right. rather than having, uh, you know, six redundant things, I just have two, two redundant things, you know, and just kind yeah. of using that to sort of minimalize my gear. Plus it, it helps your mindset because it helps you to say, okay, well, this isn't so much, you know, it's not so overwhelming. This is something doable. I can carry it. My wife can carry it. My kids yeah. can, and, and just, focus more on skills. And that's something that I think is so important. What are your thoughts on practicing and learning skills before a disaster strikes? Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, I've heard a prepper one time in one of our meetup groups say, you know, the, the more skills you obtain, the less gear you'll need. And right. um, it, it's something that I, I used to mountain climb a lot when I was growing up. I've climbed a lot of 14,000 footers in uh, nice. Colorado. I've climbed the tallest one there twice, uh, Mount Elbert. I used to do a lot in New Mexico. And one of the things you learn very quickly is uh, you know, weight is your enemy. The more gear you have, uh, the more difficult it's going to be for you. So, um, again, like you talked about, it, it's easy to begin to load up on everything you need and or you think you're going to need and realize at the end of the day, you know, that that awesome solar power flashlight hand crank, yada, yada, yada. Uh, right. Maybe it's not as important as a change of underwear, you know. And so, yeah, right. so you start kind of weigh and balance those things. And so, uh, you know, it, it's as far as practicing that's something, again, I have a background where I've done a lot of those things. It's not as easy. I'll be honest with kids. You know, they, uh, my kids, they love being indoors. They love doing things. So I'm trying to engage them and try to get them actively involved in the outdoors. Uh, and I want them to have that experience. So if anything were to you know, happen, it wouldn't be just a big shock of, oh, my gosh, you know, this is such a radical uh, and different sure. environment. How am I going to be able to survive this? And so it, it, it takes time. Um, and so that's why I'm actively, in, you know, involving them in Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts. I, you know, I'm looking forward for them to have those same experiences I did and get that, ex you know, that, that, that those skills and to develop that. It takes time. Yeah, right. Well, I, you know, I do think that that considering your children and considering your family is definitely a huge part in every person's preparedness plan. Because at the end of the day, the person who is more prepared whether that be skills alone or skills and gear will become sort of the, uh, the bastion of survival. You know, they'll become a, a beacon of hope for other people and, and other people will gravitate towards you. And you see the same type of thing happen in Syria right now with their civil war. You see it happening in Venezuela, mm -hmm. um, even just, uh, you know, in long duration economic emergencies, like in India, it happens where the people who had more skills become uh, beacons of hope for everybody else. So I think considering your family, considering your kids is such a huge part in that level of preparedness. Now, right before we go, I want to ask you, you did a video that just got huge. And I mean, it, it took on over a million views. And that's the three rules to becoming a gray man. And I urge everyone that's listening and watching to go and check this video out. I'll put a link down in the description. You touch on a couple of things there and, and it's obtainable. It's only three rules. Can you kind of tell me what your thoughts were in making it and what those three rules are? 
Yeah, the video, uh, I, I didn't really talk about this in the video itself. And looking back, I wish I had. I think it would have given me a little more credibility in the video because so many people, when they watch the video, they're like, oh, is this some kind of a, you know, are you reading too many, uh, you know, spy books or something? And right. I was like, no, it's just some things I learned uh, from practical experience. Uh, I was in Afghanistan in 03 doing NGO work, and we had a situation, I talk about this in one of my videos about Afghanistan. Uh, we were in the downtown area, we had a few girls in our group that were wearing very bright colors and they stood out. And lo and behold, we turned around after being in this, uh, it was a bazaar, you know, downtown. We turned around and we had a crowd, you know, coming down on top of us because those two individuals, they stuck out, you know, they stood out so much. Yeah. And that was, uh, you know, again, just being a very naive person at that time, I was really young. Uh, I should have seen that a mile away, but I didn't. And so it was an eye opener for me that, hey, people are going to pick up on visual cues that they'll identify with and they'll see you as, you know, a potential target or whatever. And they're going to, you know, and so the video talks about that specifically about learning how to blend into an environment. And I, I initiate, you know, at the beginning of the video, I talk about this is, you know, a gray man lifestyle is not something you want to live on a daily basis. It's something to be used in a time of crisis if you need to move, uh, you know, through a hostile you know, environment and go unnoticed or at least try to go unnoticed. And it just talks about, you know, the different parts of the brain that pick up and, and see uh, different things that will cue you as, hey, this is, there's something that's unique or stands out, a logo, a tattoo, uh, something that's different or out of the ordinary. And so the the whole point of the video is learning again, how to blend in and not stand out. And uh, it, it was based in a lot of experience after that, uh, you know, situation in Afghanistan. I, you know, I was like, look, if you want to go with me in the public, you're going to have to dress like them. After yeah, right. uh, three months there, I'd grown a full beard. I was wearing the full outfit. Um, when I was flying back to customs, I looked just like Osama bin Laden. And yeah, right. uh, I got stopped quite a lot and had a lot of, deal with a lot of issues with that. But for that environment, you know, I, I, I looked just like the part and uh, it worked. It served me very well. Yeah. And, and that's so smart too, because y you know, you can apply that same mindset to really everything. You don't want your house to be the only one with lights on during the disaster when everyone else's lights are off. You don't yep. want, you know, to have all this shiny new gear, uh, uh you know, and, and kind of showing off all this food when everyone else is going hungry. So just applying that mentality and that methodology to your life and to your preparedness will help you to better survive a disaster. Yeah, absolutely. Well, city prepping, thank you so much for being here. I urge everyone listening, go to city prepping on YouTube, uh, subscribe today. He puts out a lot of great content, high quality, well thought out content that will help you be better prepared. Uh, so thank you so much for being here with us. Hey, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. As always from Kelly and I to you and yours, we hope everyone stays safe and keeps watch. Have a good day.